This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. All right, well, we're going to be back in Daniel chapter number 8 this evening. So if you want to go ahead and turn there with me. We started Daniel chapter 8 last week, and we're going to uh, pick up where we left off. But before we do that, I want to do just a, a very little bit of review for those that might not have been able to be with us last week as we started chapter number 8. Chapter number 8 kind of goes hand in hand with what we already saw in chapter 7. Daniel's first vision is in chapter 7. His second vision is in chapter 8. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, this one will go hand in hand with it. On the whiteboard over here, I'm going to do a little bit of writing and we're just going to review a little bit. You remember in chapter number 7, we had uh, Daniel's first vision, which was during the reign of uh, Belshazzar. So that's still during the Babylonian rule. And um, in that vision, he saw four beasts. I know this is review for us, but let's do it one more time just to get it ingrained in our minds. What was the first beast that he saw? All right. And the lion represented what kingdom or empire? All right, Babylon. The second one? Bear. And the bear represented? The Medo -Persian Empire. That's right, Medo-Persian Empire. The third one? The leopard. the leopard with wings. And it represented which empire? Greece. That's right, ancient Greece, the Greek Empire. And then which one after that? Terrible, dreadful beast. <laughs> it certainly looked like the one that was in the movie. The terrible, dreadful beast. And what kingdom or empire? <coughs> TR? Rome. Rome. And what else? The and the revived Roman Empire. That's right. Rome and the revived Roman Empire. And we say the revived Roman Empire because all that was prophesied concerning this fourth empire does not appear to have been fulfilled during the old Roman Empire. So we believe that, uh, as we've talked about before, the old Roman Empire was a partial fulfillment. And in the end times, during the tribulation period, the revived Roman Empire will be the final fulfillment of this empire of the terrible beast. We talked about how the, the lion represented the Babylonian Empire. The lion uh, with wings like an eagle was an ancient symbol of the Babylonian Empire. They've even discovered in archaeological digs that um, Nebuchadnezzar's palace had these images around it. Then the bear, representing the Medo-Persian Empire. In chapter 7, the bear rolled up on one side indicating, we believe prophetically, that that alliance between the Medes and the Persians, the Medes would wane and the Persians would wax more powerful in that confederation so that the Persians became more prominent. The bear also had three ribs in its mouth, which again we talked about the likelihood that that may have been an indication that the <laughs> the Persian Empire was going to subdue three other empires and swallow them up, making it a huge empire. And we know, in fact, it swallowed up the Babylonian Empire, the uh, Egyptian Empire, and the Lydian Kingdom, or Lydian Empire, to the north up in Asia Minor or Turkey. Then we had the leopard with wings. Leopards, just like cheetahs, are known for their speed anyway. This one had wings on it. And it is a very good indication of the Greek empire that was still yet to come, led by Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world in how many years' time? Three years. Conquered everything. Then he got bored and drunk himself to death, 
uh, in a stupor there after conquering everything there was to conquer. It was all because of alcohol, wasn't it, Brother John? In three years' time, then there's the terrible beast with the old Roman Empire and the upcoming revived Roman Empire. Now in chapter 8, uh, we're going to see a vision that goes hand in hand with the first vision, but with a little more detail in a couple of places. At the end of the chapter 7 vision, we saw a character come out of the terrible beast who is referred to as the little horn. And we identified that individual as being uh, not only uh, a symbol of a leader from the Roman or revived Roman Empire, but he seems to fit very well the figure of the Antichrist that we see recorded in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Chapter number 8 now is going to give us more information about this kingdom, this kingdom, and some more information about the little horn. So let's read the first part of chapter 8 that we already covered last week and just very briefly bring out a few points. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, this is two years after the first vision, a vision appeared unto me, even to me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. So he sees a vision, and in the vision, even though this is still during the reign of Babylon, with King Belshazzar, the one that sees the handwriting on the wall, in the vision, he sees himself not in Babylon, but in the future capital of the Persian Empire, which is Shushan, or the city of Susa. S-U-S-A is another spelling of the ancient city of Shushan. And he sees himself by one of the rivers, or the, uh, the canals that connects two rivers, there near the palace in the future Persian Empire. Persia was already a a fairly large player, but they were not in charge at the time. They were still under the dominion of Babylon at the time. Now here's the vision, verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now again, this correlates to the vision he saw in chapter 7, of the, the empire of the Medo-Persians. In chapter 7, is represented by a bear. In chapter 8, it's represented by a ram, a male sheep with two horns. And it's interesting that just like the bear in chapter 7 rolled up on one side, indicative of the, the Medes going down in power and the Persians rising in power, so too does this ram have two horns one higher than the other, and the higher horn, it says, came up last, just like the Persians ascended uh, in dominance over the Medes. So here's the ram, the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse number 4, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward. By the way, those are the directions Persia went to conquer those three kingdoms that we already named so that no beasts might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. The Persian Empire certainly became great. It was so numerous after swallowing up three other major empires that it was the empire that boasted itself in ancient history, supposedly, of having an army of a million men when they invaded ancient Greece and ended up burning Athens to the ground. So Persia was certainly a, a great empire and did whatever they wanted to for a time, as long as it was in God's time. But an end comes to all things, at least all things that are not godly, so too it was with the Persian empire. Verse number 5, 
And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. So this he-goat is coming in from the west towards the east, and he's coming so fast his feet aren't even touching the ground. That sounds a whole lot like this leopard with wings uh, that's so fast his feet aren't even touching the ground. He's coming in from the west towards the east. (coughs) And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. One horn. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. We talked about how the Persians had stirred up the Greeks. The Greeks to the west, uh, the Persians on two different occasions, invaded Greece, burned Athens to the ground on one occasion, uh, did a whole lot of damage otherwise on the other occasion, and there was constant turmoil for over a hundred years between the Persians and the Greeks. It said in... I lost my place. Verse 7. I saw him come close unto the ram... And he was moved with choler, or as Brother John told us last week, anger against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. We talked just a little bit of history last week, how when Alexander the Great decided to take on the Persian Empire... In four major battles, he met and decisively defeated the Persians every time, even though the Greeks, (coughs) excuse me, the Greeks were outnumbered in all four battles. But all four times, they decisively defeated the Persians, and in the last battle, he (coughs) he, uh, uh, killed the Persian emperor. Verse 8, therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Now who was the great horn, the one horn of the he-goat? What king? Who was the king of the Greeks represented by the one horn? T.R.? I thought you were going to say the Persians. The he-goat. Brother John got it right though. Uh, The the one horn on the, uh, the he-goat was Alexander the Great. And it says that the one uh, horn was broken off <coughs> Excuse me, when he was strong. We talked about how that's exactly what happened to Alexander the Great at the height of his power, the height of his empire. After conquering the known world <coughs> in three years, He was only 33 years old, and he died. And died without an heir to take the throne. So look what it says. The great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. (coughs) We talked about historically, that's exactly what happened when Alexander the Great died. When he died, the kingdom was divided between four of his generals. Because he had no heir to the throne, to the whole kingdom, four of his generals fought for and divided up all of Alexander's uh, kingdom, his empire. Exactly what was predicted here, approximately 300 years before it took place. So very great detail in this prophecy that was delivered hundreds of years before it actually came to pass. Verse 9 And out of one of them, that is one of those four notable horns, out of one of them came forth a, what? A little horn. Here's the little horn again. Which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Now what piece of land or territory did we say is represented in Scripture as the pleasant land? Israel, Israel, that's right. The promised land. The pleasant land is the same as the promised land. So here we see again a little horn. Now in this vision, we're not looking at the fourth kingdom 
with the terrible beast of the Roman and the revived Roman Empire, but we're still seeing the little horn. We're going to see here that the little horn that is mentioned in chapter 8, some Bible commentators want to say this is a totally separate person than the little horn we saw in chapter 7. We already know that the little horn we saw in chapter 7 seems to line up pretty nicely with the Antichrist who's in the future. I think what we saw here and what we're going to finish seeing tonight is that the little horn of chapter 8 is one of those instances where it's a double fulfillment of Scripture or a partial fulfillment and then the final fulfillment. The partial fulfillment we identified as an historical person that was a member of one of those four families that divided up Alexander the Great's empire. His name, anybody write down his name? He's from the Seleucid family. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Now some of the things described here that we're about to read in Daniel chapter 8 were definitely a perfect match for the things that were fulfilled and done by Antiochus Epiphanes. But not everything we're going to read in chapter 8 was fulfilled in this person. Some, most, but not all. So Antiochus Epiphanes becomes what we call in Scripture a type of the Antichrist. When we say a type of the Antichrist, we mean a shadow. Or we could even say a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. But because Antiochus Epiphanes doesn't fulfill everything in chapter 8 that we're about to read, I believe we're on safe ground to assume that just like the little horn in chapter 7, the little horn of chapter 8 and Antiochus Epiphanes in history are pre-shadowing the coming Antichrist also. We're going to see those things in just a moment. Some of the things we read about Antiochus Epiphanes uh, that we'll see in a moment match up very, very closely with actual historical events. Those four families, four generals that divided up Alexander the Great's empire, there were two of them that were the most prominent. The one that was down in Egypt as Kim said just a moment ago, was the Ptolemy family. And the Ptolemies ruled Egypt for hundreds of years, although they were Greeks. They were the descendants of one of Alexander's generals. So there were Greeks ruling Egypt for several hundred years. One of the most prominent members of the Ptolemy family, as we mentioned before, <coughs> was that... Uh, Supposedly very attractive woman that both Julius Caesar and uh, Mark Antony both fell in love with. Who was she? I don't say Elizabeth Taylor. Taylor. It was Cleopatra. That's right. Cleopatra was uh, one of the future members of the Ptolemy family. The other general whose family becomes very prominent historically and especially in prophecy in Daniel, was the family that uh, took over what used to be Syria and Babylon. The family that took over Syria was the Seleucid family. The Seleucids. And Antiochus Epiphanes, if I remember correctly, was the eighth generation of Seleucid rulers that ruled that fourth of the old Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. It's the area of Syria, modern day Syria, and modern day Iraq, where the land between the rivers lies, the Tigris and the Euphrates. All right, so we've, <clears throat> we've gotten down to the little horn here in chapter 8. Verse number 10, describing the little horn, says this. 
And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. We discussed how there's a debate whether that's talking about some of the Jews following him or perhaps some of the angels following the little horn. Of course, if we're referring to the actual Antichrist, we know there are fallen angels who follow Satan who will certainly be doing the bidding of the Antichrist in the future. It says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. I'm not going to go through all the details we did last week for time's sake, but some of the notorious things Antiochus Epiphanes did as ruler to exalt himself even above God and to um, seek to destroy the Jews who were still in the pleasant land. Historically, he took for himself the name Epiphanes. The word epiphany is a manifestation of something. He claimed he was the manifestation of God. And he had some coins minted. He was so prideful, so arrogant. On his coins, I'm not going to draw his face on uh, the coin again because y'all laughed at my drawing last week. But it had a picture of his face on the coin. And on the back side, it had a statue of Zeus and it said, Theos Epiphanes, meaning that he was saying he was the image of God. Zeus was his patron God, so he was saying he was the bodily manifestation of his God, Zeus, in the flesh. He ascribed to himself deity. Of course, we know that's very similar to what the Antichrist will do during the tribulation to come. That's why he's called the Antichrist. He sets himself up as the Messiah or the Christ. He killed many of the Jews, just like the Antichrist is going to do. On one occasion in three days' time, I gave you the numbers last week, he killed more than 40,000 Jews in three days and took another 10,000 of them back home to Syria as his slaves. He had the high priest of the Jews removed from the temple and killed, publicly executed. And in the temple, there in Jerusalem, where Jehovah God was worshipped, where they offered sacrifices in the morning and in the evening, according to the Mosaic law, what did he do that was so horrible that defiled the altar and defiled the temple? He sacrificed a pig. He literally took a sow, put her on the altar, and sacrificed a pig on the altar of Jehovah. You know Jews aren't supposed to eat anything that's unclean and a pig is the epitome of uncleanness. But he didn't just eat pig in the temple. He offered one to his god Zeus on the altar and then had a statue of Zeus erected in the house of God in Jerusalem. The desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes is one of the events of history that is referred to here and referred to also in the New Testament. Jesus called it, in Matthew 24 and 25, the abomination What, Ms. Kim? That's right, of desolation. The abomination of desolation. We know what an abomination is. An abomination is something that's worse than bad. It's horrible. Desolation, if something is desolate, it means nothing can live there. Nothing exists there. Nothing can be, it can't be used for anything. So the, the, the abomination of the pig, the sow being offered on the altar of God, is called the abomination of desolation. Or the abomination that maketh desolate. It's referred to by Jesus when he's talking about the end times 
in Matthew 24 and 25. One of the ways that we know that Antiochus Epiphanes is not the complete fulfillment of Daniel chapter 8 is because Jesus himself speaks of the abomination of desolation. And of course all the Jews who were listening to Jesus knew historically about that in the past when Jesus was speaking to them. But he said, that is still yet to come. He was talking about the Antichrist. If we have time tonight or maybe uh, in the future, perhaps we'll look at Matthew 24 and 25. But Jesus saying, no, everything wasn't fulfilled here. That is an indication to us that he was just a foreshadowing of the one that is still to come who will be just as bad or worse than Antiochus Epiphanes in lifting himself up as God and seeking to destroy the children of Israel that remain during the, during the time of the tribulation that's yet to come. <coughs> All right, that brings us down to verse 13. Are there any questions up to this point? All right, let's dig in. Here we go, T.R. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So we have here a period of 2,300 days. I've run out of room on my whiteboard, so I'm going to erase all of this. And uh, let's do a little bit of math here. 2,300 days. Now, I mentioned last week that the Jewish calendar, the traditional Jewish calendar, is not like our calendar. It has the same number of months, 12 months, but how many days are in a month? 30 days in a month. Now, some of our months have 30, some have 31. If you give me long enough to sit there and say the little rhyme, I can tell you which ones have which number of days. And then, of course, there's February that has 28 until leap year makes it 29. What's that? Is that right? I didn't realize that. So this month, all right. But in the Jewish calendar, there are 30 days (coughs) in every month. So somebody with a a phone or a calculator, want to do the math here? Divide 2,300 by 30 days, and let's see how many months this is. Nobody, nobody's doing this. You're going to make the preacher do the long math. I need Abigail here. So... Six. So now we're in the end. Six, six, six. All right. So about 76 months. And how many months are in a year? Well, that's 12. So 12 times six is 72 months. So about 72 and a third. What am I doing? Six and a third years. A little over six years. If you look at the time that Antiochus Epiphanes was waging his destruction on the Pleasant Land, historically, it comes out to just a little over six years historically. By the way, the temple there in Jerusalem that was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes, it was not used for the children of Israel during all the time that Antiochus Epiphanes was still running rampant until the Jews rose up and revolted against him and drove him out of the land of Israel. That was done by a group of Jewish rebels called the Maccabeans. The Maccabean Revolt ran the Seleucids out of the Pleasant Land and they rededicated the temple and the altar to God 
so they could begin using it again to worship Jehovah God. When they ran Antiochus Epiphanes and the Seleucids out after that uh, about six and a half years, um, that was the first time of Hanukkah. That's what, that's what Hanukkah today is a celebration of in the Jewish faith, is when the Jews took back control of their land and the temple of God and rededicated the temple to Jehovah through Antiochus Epiphanes out. So there's a little bit of Jewish history to go with your Georgia history from earlier today. All right, verse 15. Let's see some more about the little horn. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now we have two angels in Scripture who are called by name. Only two. There are lots of angels in Scripture, but only two that are called by name. Here's one of them. This one is Gabriel. We're going to see Gabriel again later on in the Scriptures in the New Testament. Where are we going to see Gabriel later on in the New Testament? That's right. He is the one who announced both to Mary and to Joseph the birth of Jesus and the, the miracle of the virgin birth. So here we see Gabriel. There's only one other angel that is mentioned by name in Scripture. Who's the other one? Michael. That's right. Michael the archangel. By the way, both of these angels are going to be mentioned by name in the book of Daniel before we're finished with the book of Daniel. We just saw Gabriel. We're going to see Michael before we finish the book of Daniel. Actually, it's still in too, That's true. We're going to come up on that in just a couple of chapters, by the way. All right. So here's the angel that's about to explain to Daniel the vision and it's none other than Gabriel. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now here's our next clue that everything Daniel was seeing, though to us it seems historically like it could have been fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes, and yet Gabriel plainly tells Daniel, this vision is of the end times. Now we know that Antiochus Epiphanes was not part of the end times. In fact, he, it's already been more than 2,000 years ago since he lived and walked the earth. So certainly Antiochus Epiphanes was not part of the end times. So we know that this is still yet to be totally fulfilled we assume by the Antichrist. Verse 18. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. So he's having a vision, and now he's asleep in his vision. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the appointed for at the time appointed, the end shall be. What does the word indignation mean? You can cheat and look it up if you need to. An embarrassment, that's right. I think uh, embarrassment is a good word. Um, a, a pouring out of anger. And a causing of embarrassment, I think both of those together kind of adequately describe the indignation. So Gabriel tells him, what you're seeing here is for the end of time, and uh, for the time appointed, the end shall be. Verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So we don't have to guess that that's what the ram represented. Gabriel tells us it is. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. 
And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. There's Alexander the Great. By the way, again, this is more than 300 years before Alexander the Great's death. So this is many years prophetically. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Those four kingdoms that were made up of Alexander's four generals, their kingdoms never even came close to comparing to the the power and the glory of Alexander the Great's unified kingdom. Verse 23, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. I think in verse 23, we begin to see a transition from just talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, the historical character, now we're seeing the Antichrist. From verse 23 on, I think we're seeing not the exploits of Antiochus Epiphanes, but the one that he was foreshadowing. And it says of him here, when the transgression, when the transgressors are come to the full. Doesn't that sound like a good description of what Jesus said about the coming end times when Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. Remember what the Bible said about the days of Noah? Man was wicked continually and his thoughts were only evil. That's a good description of where we're headed towards the tribulation period when this little horn, the Antichrist, will be revealed. (coughs) A king of fierce countenance. The Antichrist is going to be formidable. No one will be able to stand against him, humanly speaking. He will be indwelt by Satan himself. And he will have the ability to do great miraculous things because of the power of Satan who is using him and controlling him. It also says an interesting thing about him, an understanding dark sentences. What do you think that means? Understanding dark sentences. All right, TR, give it a shot. Being able to hear demons and Satan himself speak um, whether audibly or through signs, signs of wickedness. So he's able to see and understand the spiritual world, specifically the occult, demonic activity. I think all throughout history, going all the way back to the Tower of Babel after the flood, we see numerous examples in writing and in religions where there are occultic, satanic, demonic things that are going on in the world, there have been different individuals throughout history who have claimed to be able to communicate with those spirits. Some maybe were uh, fakes and frauds and phonies. Some of them perhaps legitimate. This man will certainly be able to do that for he will be indwelt by Satan himself who is the commander of all those dark forces. He will understand all those mystery religions, all of the occultic religions. Verse 24, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. So we're talking about the future Antichrist. Is he going to be powerful during the tribulation period? He sure will. In fact, the church will have already been raptured out before the tribulation. So when the church is taken out, we've mentioned this before, so too is the Holy Spirit taken out. The books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Paul tells us plainly the the only reason that Satan is not able to have his run on the earth now is because the Holy Spirit is holding him back. Once the Holy Spirit is taken out with the church, then Satan 
will have his heyday. He'll have his run of the earth. Now, I'm not particularly a fan of everything written by this individual, but back in the 70s, the book came out, The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was about the coming tribulation period and how Satan will control the things going on here on earth. I think that was Hal Lindsey that wrote that book back in the 70s. Satan is going to control all the things going on here. You have God pouring out His wrath on lost mankind during the tribulation once the church is taken out. But you also have Satan running around trying to run the world and trying to get everyone that's left to follow him in one big rebellion against God. The Antichrist will have great power like it said, but not his own power. He is working under the power of Satan. And he shall destroy wonderfully. Now that doesn't mean it will be nice. It just means he will be able to destroy totally. No one, nothing will be able to stand against him. And shall prosper and practice. It's kind of unusual. We know what the word prosper means. It means to succeed in whatever he does. The word practice is kind of unusual to be used in this sense. But I think if we realize the fact that he will be practicing witchcraft, magic, sorcery, I think the word practice makes good use uh, or is very fitting to be used here. And shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Now, who are the holy people that Gabriel is talking about here? The Jews, that's right. God's chosen people physically. Now, remember in the Old Testament, going all the way back to uh, Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19, the people of Israel made a covenant with God to be His peculiar people. And all throughout the Old Testament, God's desire, His design was to, uh, for Israel to obey Him. And if they did, He would bless them so abundantly that all the Gentile nations of the world would be drawn to them to want to know who is your God that blesses you so. But you and I know the sad reality is Israel never measured up to that. No sooner did they make that covenant at the foot of Mount Sinai than two chapters later we see them dancing around half naked around the golden calf before Moses even gets back down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. They never lived up to their part of the covenant. Consequently, that conditional covenant, God was never able to follow through with what He promised He would do if they would do their part. So God took Israel as a nation and set them over on the shelf, proverbially proverbially speaking, Israel today is spiritually set on a shelf. I know there are some Jewish people that have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but they're very few, very far between. Most Jews today do not worship Jesus. They don't worship the same God we do. Jesus said of them in His day, they worship their father, the devil. Most Jews today are not worshiping the same God we worship in spite of what a lot of big name preachers say. So God has set Israel on the shelf. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that he would, that God would save all of Israel. He said he would even be willing to be cast into hell if the rest of his people would be saved. But you and I know that's not what has happened. And Paul describes in Romans chapter 12 how the branches of that olive tree that God groomed Israel have been broken off because of their unbelief. And he has grafted into the olive tree branches off a wild olive tree. That's us. That's our ancestors, the Gentiles, who are not any special people. We're not purebreds or thoroughbreds. We're just a bunch of mongrels and mutts. I have Scotch-Irish, Cherokee, and who knows what else. You probably are the same. We're not a 
a special people like Israel was that God groomed as a domesticated olive tree. So God has broken those branches off and grafted us in from the wild olive tree. And God today is using the church to do what Israel was supposed to do in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. But one day, the church isn't going to be here anymore. When the rapture takes place just before the tribulation, God's going to then turn back to Israel, pick her up off the shelf, and once again, God's going to begin to use Israel to evangelize the world. Now that's during the tribulation period. Doesn't mean all of Israel will be saved, but some will. More than today. So, back to our text here. It says that he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Isn't that an interesting turn of a phrase? By peace, he shall destroy many. We usually think that it's by war that people are destroyed. But I think about some examples from modern history where peace, or so-called peace, was used to destroy many. The United Nations claims to be a peacekeeping organization. But the truth is they have started more wars and and propped up more dictators around the world than any other institution in human history, all in the name of peace. I think the Antichrist will be a good example of this. He will pretend to bring peace, but that's only so he can disarm those that he's about to destroy. Israel won't be any different than that. Israel will sign a covenant with the Antichrist at the beginning of the seven years. And he will break it halfway through the seven years. Let's continue on. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Who's the prince of princes? Jesus, that's right. The king of kings, lord of lords, and the prince of princes. That's Jesus. He says he will stand up against the prince of princes but he shall be broken without hand. You know, I think about the end of the tribulation period and the description of the battle of Armageddon. There really isn't too much battle to it. Jesus just destroys all of his enemies without even having to do any fighting. That's not much of a battle, but that's all it's going to take to destroy the Antichrist and all of Satan's forces that are arrayed with him. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. In other words, this is still far in the future yet to come. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. And afterward I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Why do you think Daniel was sick certain days? Just drained the life out of him. It, did, it definitely drained the life out of him. What specifically about these visions do you think drained the life out of him and made him sick? I think you're right, Uncle Milton. He sees this is what's coming for his own people. And he hurts to see that this is what is coming for the Jewish people, his own people. Because all that's prophesied here, all of this is to take place against his people in the pleasant land. So here we come to the end of chapter 8. Again, we've seen another little horn. This little horn is, I think, the same person as the little horn in chapter 7. But we're seeing a partial fulfillment in the historical person of Antiochus Epiphanes up till verse 23. And from verse 23 on, it's about the person that Antiochus Epiphanes is a shadow of. 
the real Antichrist who's yet to come. In this chapter, we saw, well, in chapter 7, we saw that the little horn comes out of that fourth beast, which is the Roman or revived Roman Empire. Remember the ten horns that spring up? And one horn plucks up three of those, and he is said to be a stout little horn. So I think chapter 7 tells us the, the Antichrist will be the leader of the revived Roman Empire. But in this chapter, chapter 8, this vision, the little horn comes out of that kingdom which is one of the four from Alexander's. You have the Greek Empire and when the one notable horn is broken, four come up in its place. Alexander's four generals. We're told specifically in the prophecy which one it is from which the little horn springs. It's the Seleucid Empire because it tells us which way the Seleucids expand. To the north, to the west, and to the pleasant land. That's the direction the Seleucids were expanding. They were here, Syria and Iraq, moving this way towards the rest of the former Greek empire. So the little horn here is said to have come out of the Seleucid Empire, the Greek Empire, in the area of Syria and Iraq. One last thing, and I'm going to close here. I don't pretend to know the answer to this, but I'm going to share with you two possibilities. Some literal Bible commentators who take a literal interpretation like we do say that this little horn that's mentioned in chapter 8 is just further describing the little horn who's going to rule the revived Roman Empire during the tribulation. But there are some Bible commentators, including some Baptists, Protestants that take a literal interpretation of Scripture like we do, who say that it's possible the little horn could actually reasonably fulfill both of these. Yes, the Antichrist will come from the revived Roman Empire, but when you look at the old Roman Empire, the old Roman Empire also took in this area here that went all the way to the east to modern-day Persia or Iran. So they say that the, the Antichrist, yes, he will rule the revived Roman Empire, but he may very well come from this part of the old Roman Empire. And there are uh, several books that have been written, and you can find some things on YouTube also, who describe the Antichrist by calling him the Assyrian. Because there are a couple of Old Testament passages that seem to be talking about the Antichrist that do call him the Assyrian. If that be so, then it could be that whoever the Antichrist is going to be one day, he could very well become the leader of the, the entire revived Roman Empire and still be from this part of the world, which is the old Assyrian Empire, it's made up today of the countries of Syria and Iraq. Roughly the same territory as the caliphate that Mr. Trump just squashed. But there could be something else come back up in its place, in its stead. Or some, uh, some part of the European Union or the revived Roman Empire that takes control of this area. I don't know whether he will, the person of the Antichrist will literally come from this region, but he certainly is going to rule all of the revived Roman Empire. You can go and do some studying for yourself and decide which you think, uh, but there are the two possibilities. It's a very interesting study 
on whether the Antichrist might be the Assyrian in uh, the Old Testament. Any questions or comments? Observations? We finished chapter 7 and chapter 8. They're two different visions, two years apart, but they go very much together in what Daniel sees in the two visions, especially the kingdoms of Persia and Greece and the arrival of that person, the little horn. Now in chapter number 9, just to kind of whet your appetite, since we won't be back together for our Bible study next week, we have our baptismal service and then it'll be the next week, Lord willing, we'll be back in Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, Daniel chapter 9 is perhaps the most exciting chapter in all the Bible for one reason. When we go through the prophecies that are given in Daniel chapter 9, and we do some math work, you're going to see that the prophecies that were given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, if you do the math, the Jews should have known to the year when the Messiah was coming. Had they known their Bible the Old Testament, and had they been worshiping the true and living God, they could have all been watching for the Messiah because they should have known when he was going to arrive. Some of the Jews were watching. When Jesus was brought to the temple at the age of eight days to be circumcised, Simeon was in the temple watching and waiting because he knew it was time for the Messiah. He wasn't the only one there that was watching and waiting. But all of Israel should have known when the Messiah was coming. I promise if you miss any, any of our weeks, you don't want to miss the week that we cover Daniel chapter 9 two weeks from now.